What is up and I welcome each and every one of you back to a brand new Civ 6 or Civilization 6 video. Today we are going to be talking about how the new Frontier Pass changed everything. And by everything, I do mean everything. Without further ado, let's get started. We're going to be talking about how Civ usually does its DLCs. Why the new Frontier Pass was different, what was good about it, what was bad about it, what made me cry absolute tears about it, and what it means for the future of Civ. This is all obviously my opinion, but I do think I sort of have a grasp of where they're go coming from and where they're going. So, uh, yeah, without further ado, if you like, or like, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff. If you don't like it, I guess you could dislike or leave the video or just block me on YouTube or something. I don't even know how that works, but, uh, yeah, let's get started. So the first thing we are going to talk about is how does Civ actually do its DLCs? We have to get a sort of barometer, a base meter on exactly what they usually do and what differs about it. So essentially what happened was it usually goes, they make their game, Civ 6, 5, 4. Then they make two DLCs afterwards containing so much content, a couple new Civs and a couple new game mechanics. For example, the Rise and Fall added the loyalty mechanic and Civs like the Ottomans. Uh, Gods and Kings and Civ 5 added religion while gathering storm and civ 6 added the weather and other civs like the maui for example so essentially every game update is super big super content packed and it's usually worth it for the most part like pound for pound it usually is worth the money but the way that it differs with the new frontier pass is that in civ 6 instead of going for two dlcs and then going for a spin-off game or going into civ 7 they actually added in another not quite dlc but it was still as much content as a regular DLC. That is the new Frontier Pass. Now, I don't know exactly what changed in Civ and what made them decide to want to do the new Frontier Pass. I'm assuming they got some inspiration from like Battle Pass and games like Fortnite and Warzone and stuff like that. But essentially what the new Frontier Pass was is every month they release uh, different content every couple of months, I think it was. And essentially it's sort of like a fully sized DLC pack but it spread out over the course of, I think it took about a year for them to finish everything. April was when they ended and they put the first part in May. So it was about 365 days of them working on the new Frontier Pass. But let's actually get into what the new Frontier Pass was and what exactly did it add. So let's take a look at the actual new Frontier Pass. We are in the Civilization Wiki. I did press F11 on the computer because I'm not revealing my search history whatsoever. But essentially, we're going to be going through everything and exactly what each pack added. There were six different packs, I guess, over the course of a year. And each month or each pack added either different civs, city-states, game modes, all that good stuff. Let's start out with the first pack, the May pack, the Mayan and Grand Colombian packs. They added two new civilizations, Mayan led by Lady Thick Thighs, I mean Six Guys, and Grand Columbia led by Simon Bolivar. New city-states included Caguana, Singapore, Lahore, Vatican, Taruga, and Hansa, along with different city-states that uh, replaced other the civilizations, because I think the Mayan uh, city-state was replaced by Taruga, if I'm honest and not mistaken. They also added in Honey as a luxury and Maze as a bonus resource. They added in Apocalypse Mode, the Bermuda Triangle, Paititi, and Fountain of Youth, Natural Wonders. After that, we we could take a look at Ethiopia, which added in Menelik II as Ethiopia, a faith and culture sieve. Probably the most unique and probably well-balanced sieve out of this entire pack, I think. Not too strong, not too weak, unlike unlike some people, Babylon. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they also added in Secret Societies, which is personally my favorite game mode. And they also added the Diplomatic Quarter, and as well as the Consulate and Chancery for the Diplomatic Quarter, which essentially gave you different ways to get more Diplo favor, pretty much. There really isn't anything too much to it. After that, we do have the Byzantium and Gaul pack, adding in Byzantium and the Gaul civilizations led by Basil and Ambiorix. They added in Dramatic Ages, which I absolutely despise as a game mode, and they added New World Wonders like the Biosphere Statue of Zeus and the Highlands map mode, which is pretty good for civs like the Incans. Next up, we got oh, the Babylon pack. Oh my god. God, was that pack absolutely disgusting. Babylon led by Hammurabi, one of the best civs in the game in my opinion. You also have in Heroes and Legends, which is pretty fun, although it does make the game a little too easy. After that, you add in Ayuthia, Johannesburg, Chinguida, Wolin, Samarkand, and Nalanda, as well as a couple new great people. So, uh, penultimately, we do have Vietnam and Kublai Khan, adding in Kublai Khan and 
the Batrio as the leader of uh, both Kublai Khan was actually leader of Mongolia and China and uh, Vietnam was just the leader of Vietnam I guess it's pretty obvious but we got the Monopolies and Corporations game mode another pretty solid game mode the preserved district giving rise to groves sanctuaries and immediately jolting bull moose teddy up to like the top of the ladders after that we got the Portugal led by Zhao the third zombie defense mode Tor du Balem, Etemenanki, and a Wetlands game map to the uh, benefit of Vietnam. And we also had two leader persona changes. We got Bull Moose Teddy, and we also got Catherine Magnificence. That is essentially all of it. Let's get into the good, the bad, the ugly, the horrendous, and the stuff that makes me cry myself to sleep of the New Frontier Pass. So, I think the good about the New Frontier Pass is the fact that there was new content every month. Whereas usually it would be like one massive pack released and then like two years of just nothing from Civilization, any really game. So I think that's definitely a benefit. The other benefits, I think, are the fact that you do have different game modes, but you don't have to play with them. For example, if they just made this a regular DLC and every game had Apocalypse mode and every game had Dramatic Ages, uh, that would be a little bit too far in my opinion. Most people wouldn't like that, but having them added in as game modes for both different challenges and also just so people can have fun with them is definitely a great way to implement these sort of, I guess... Uh, unpopular game modes. I don't want to call them unpopular, but I don't think anyone likes playing with Dramatic Age. <laughs> oh my god, that almost killed me. But I don't think anyone likes playing with Dramatic Ages, honestly, nor Zombie Defense. I don't think I've ever tried that game mode out. But essentially, if you want these game modes for a challenge or something, you can add these game modes if you want, which I think was great. The other thing I like about it is the fact that they also added in a DLC's worth when it comes to great people, city-states, resources, wonders, and natural wonders, along with another district. So over the course of an entire year, you would get exactly what you'd get from the DLC. Obviously, the bad is, well, we don't get it immediately. You have to wait every couple of months. I don't find that to be the worst thing in the world, but I could understand why people wouldn't like that. Obviously, having to wait for a new content is, uh, people do get impatient sometimes. Um, but all in all, I think it wasn't too bad. We also got free updates, balance changes, scenarios, new maps, etc. Not only that, but I also don't really like the fact that some of these city-states were a little too overpowered on release. Grand Colombia, Babylon, Byzantium, Portugal were all absolutely, they're so broken, disgustingly powerful. Uh, especially with the uh, Grand Colombia, you could get seven movement speed horsemen. Enough said. Enough said. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to relive those memories. But essentially, I feel like some of them were a little too strong. Kind of have to be, I guess, if you do sort of want to sell this, because all in all, the civilizations are sort of the most selling uh, aspect of the New Frontier Pass, or really any DLC. You really, what, you really like care about the civs that are added. So that was essentially the good. I The bad was... We we did kind of do the bad uh the fact that each sieve took or like it took a year to actually get a dlc's uh, sized worth of content some people might be impatient as well as the little overpowered mechanics they did add towards the end i don't think there was anything too bad about the game modes though you know adding in the new frontier pass was you know good for the most part and i do think it also helped build hype for the game there wasn't anything that was terrible compared to if they released it in sort of like one dlc sized packet um I, I really don't know let me know down below in the comments what you guys think but i don't find anything that was too terrible for the most part uh let's go ahead and talk about the results and how it did i guess monetarily for civ 6 and here we are at an article about uh, what the developers said about the new Frontier Pass. I only have this up, you know, don't worry, I'm not going to be another, I don't know, just a uh, review channel or whatever. But they did say something. I uh, Right here. Uh, the associate producer and lead designer said the new Frontier Pass was definitely a success. We did have a sales expectation to meet. And uh, that pretty much sort of sums it up. That's the only thing I really wanted. But, you know, over here, you know, they also talked about how by having them play more, we have something to look forward to every month instead of these awkward gaps of radio silence in between bigger releases as well as player engagement uh sid has followed similar peaks and troughs to others that enjoy a mature life cycle initial game launches through the roof but at the same time engagement declines as you progress although there are boosts of activity around patches and expansions but those major events the same downward motion occurs and then the only thing right here i want to look at is one really cool stat is the first month of the new frontier pass the active users was actually 
higher than when we launched Rise and Fall or Gathering Storm. That's essentially what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so when they released New Frontier Pass, it was actually higher reception than when they got Rise and Fall and Gathering Storm. For a game that's four and a half years old, it's just incredible. And that is usually the later a game goes on, the less popular it's going to get, especially a game like Civ 6, which is going to, you know, it's not anything like, I don't know, World of Warcraft, where they're just adding new DLCs and they're not making new games every single year or every single few years. I do think it was much, they're saying it was a lot better than if they just made a regular DLC. So I think the results were definitely really good for like the company as a whole. Uh, and I, I can see why exactly, because you have new people coming in every single month, not to mention that you're still going to have high player engagement well after the new Frontier Pass ended, solely because you just have a lot more sieves than usual. You also have a lot more mechanics that really aren't going to get older stale for a little while longer. Uh, obviously, it depends on who you are, but I think the results were for the most part positive. There was a sale expectation met, and the fact that you could both buy the entire pass and also specific packs if you uh, either didn't want to or were struggling with money or something, I feel like definitely helped uh, get more sales than usual. You know, instead of having like an entire, I don't know, you have to get this entire DLC or you really can't get any of the sieves it's all or nothing being able to buy different packs definitely helps out a lot and i guess increasing sales probably i don't know i'm not a business major but uh yeah essentially i think the results were good for the most part really good in fact and i think this will lead in well into the next and final topic we're going to be discussing what's in the future so I think all in all, they're going to try to adopt this model a little bit more later on. I feel like when they do release another DLC or another game in general, they're going to sort of roll out the changes a lot more gradually. From what I've read and from what I personally think, I do think it's a lot better and makes a lot more sense for the company, obviously, for the company to gradually uh, push out these changes just so you don't have like spikes and trolls because, you know, you're just throwing, like, blowing your entire load in, like, one day, or you release everything at once, but I think in the future, I think we're going, I don't know, but I think we're going to get one more pack for Civilization VI. I know, I know, it sounds like they're finished with the game, they released the Anthology Edition, which includes everything, but I think they're going to, with the success of the new Frontier Pass, it does make a lot more sense to add in another DLC, whereas making a new game, obviously whenever Civ makes new games, they never include anything. Civ Five base game was terrible, Civ Six base game wasn't much better, so they, again, they kind of have to do that, because if they don't, then they can't really uh, add in different patches, or whatnot, if that makes any sense. Uh, but I think they're going to add in one more DLC, also due to Humankind's popularity since launch. I do think it makes sense to work on this game, make it the best it can be, whereas if you make a new game and it doesn't turn out to be as good, you would have people waiting a couple of years for a DLC to release, in which time they could go and play other games, and the, I guess the rating wouldn't be as high or whatever. But that's just my opinion, so I do think we're going to get one sort of, probably another new Frontier Pass type of thing, maybe not over the course of a year, maybe a mini new Frontier Pass over six months while they work on new games probably. I think that's what is going to happen. Although thinking about it, there aren't really too many sieves they could add that they haven't already. Um... I, I, I don't know, unless they want to go uh, like uh, the controversial rat and pick Soviet Union or the no-no Germans or something like that. I don't think there really is too much more they could add, but I don't, I don't know. I just have a feeling that they're going to, they're not done with this game yet, I think is what I'm trying to say. But um, yeah, it's pretty much what I think is in the future. Another pack before releasing Civilization 7. I think they're probably, they might even skip the spinoff game entirely, or we just get Civilization Revolution 3. But uh, that's essentially going to be the entire video again i am streaming right now i'm streaming the ultimate civ 6 challenge watch the video if you haven't already but essentially what it is i have to go 50 and 0 i have one game with each civ i have to go in alphabetical order i can't re-roll no restarts and uh i have to try to win all 50 games without losing once so wish me luck we're starting the first game uh today on stream on twitch.tv slash civ life for one and on this youtube channel uh so definitely go and check it out but without further ado I will see you all in the next video. Peace. Huge shout out to my members Cash Christian, Ben Ombi, John Blair, Jackson Perez, Polaris Gaming, Empuerium, Adam Mester, Jeff Utzler, Kim Cosmos. A really special shout out to my oh my god subscribers, Robert and Overflow of Amenities.